the minute to get going. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Networkers Without Borders. Um, today we have Diane Darling, who's going to be addressing um, building relationships that matter. We talk about networking a lot in this group, and it's something that either people love or hate. But the important part of networking is the building relationships part, and that's what we're going to focus on today. I'm excited to have Diane with us today, and I'm going to turn the program over to her, Diane. Thank you so much. I'm really delighted to join you all today. I really believe networking is incredibly important. My grandfather was a partner at a law firm and he was painfully shy, but found people very interesting. So I learned from him small talk and he would sit on a park bench and in a few minutes, we'd be almost best friends with just about anybody. And I learned that from him. I also learned from my other grandfather who went to eighth grade um, on how to connect with people of all, all types. And so what I want to do is just share some different thoughts with you on staying connected, how you can build relationships that matter at work and beyond, because even once we get out of COVID, I think we're going to really revisit how we connect with people and some of the things that matter with that. So what I want to start out here with is this image of the uh, FedEx logo. And I'm going to assume that most of you have seen the FedEx logo several times before. What you may or may not have seen is the hidden arrow. So part of the point of this slide is that, you know, often what um, I, the feedback I get was, you know, Diane, you didn't really tell me anything I didn't know before, but you helped shape it or frame it in a way I hadn't thought before, even though I've seen it before. So if you've seen the logo, yes, you may have not seen the arrow, which is between the E and the X in the white space. And let me see if I can't find a little highlighter here. And, um, so it's going to be right here in that area. Oops, I didn't do that right. Let me pick the other right tool here. Uh, let's see, a laser pointer. Let's see if that works. Yep, right here in that little E and X is the hidden arrow. And so again, the point of this is, is that maybe I'm not going to tell you anything rocket science, but I'm hoping to package this a little bit more and help you think about it differently. One courageous person during the introduction said that they're not bad at the in-person networking, the online networking is what feels challenging and the relationship building here. I heard someone the other day said, we're over connected these days and we're probably in some cases more connected than ever. The other night, last night, I walked back from the dentist. It's about a half an hour walk. Every single person I walked by was either looking at their phone, talking on their phone or had the phone in their hand. So in the last 30, 40 years since the web has been around, hard to believe it's been around that long, um, we've just absolutely changed our life. Remember the days when you used to go to the post office and, you know, and, and get, a, you know, get a package or you used to, um, you know, open up, you know, the mailbox and we're excited to have a letter from a friend. So these days we have a pressure of speed and volume. Right now I'm sitting on 20,000 emails in my inbox and every day I clean out a whole bunch and every day there's a whole bunch more and I still unsubscribe and life just happens. So we wanna think about the quality versus the quantity of our relationships. And that's something I'm gonna really hang, you know, hang with you on this because it's, I think in some cases we are way too pressured to have how many connections do you have and things like that. That really isn't as important as the quality of the connections. Quick introduction, I'm an author with McGraw-Hill. I also self-published on Amazon. My books are in nine languages. So this is a universal topic that we experience. I am a speaker. I do motivational speaking on resilience and mindset. I do fun speaking and, and tactical practical things such as public speaking, networking, relationship building, and things along those lines. Um, I used to be in the travel business. People find this interesting. I've been to all 60 continents, I mean, all 60 countries and seven continents. And one of the things that has motivated me along these lines or inspired me was I knew what it was like to be a new kid in school. I was a new kid in first grade, that was the Philippines, second grade, Colorado, third grade, Indiana, seventh grade, Washington, DC. So I've had lots of different experiences and somewhere in there, I went to rural Indiana. So part of it is I had to learn how to talk to people, even though at times it totally exhausted me. 
So one thing I've done some research along these lines, and this is not, you know, vetted by anybody when I present these, I don't present these numbers at MIT because they challenge me. It's just more anecdotal sort of stuff. I'll do a survey along those lines. Why we don't like reaching out, why we don't like networking, we're intimidated by strangers. And this is the moment I can, I'm going to encourage you to say, you can go, and if your parent, if you're lucky to have your parents alive, fine. If not, just say thank you to them in heaven. You protected me. You cared about me because you told me when I was a kid, don't talk to strangers. So we go online or we go into an event and we see people we don't know. And we think that's a stranger, stranger danger. So we have to revisit our, our concept when we get online and see all these different faces on Zoom or when we go into a room and we see people who we don't know and say, you know what? I don't know that person yet, but I'd like to have a conversation with them and see what we have in common. We already had some people who went to the same law school in the introductions. Another thing was people didn't know what to say. So I'm gonna introduce you to a concept called rehearsed spontaneity. This is where you know how to introduce yourself or you have starter conversations and it's not the first time you've said it, but it's probably the first time you've said it to them. So I have starter conversations such as tell me followed by anything. Tell me where you went to law school. Tell me what type of law you practice. These are things that in many cases make it possible for people to find a way for us to have a connection. Yes, we have a lot of other things to do. Some people think networking is not a part of their job. I will share with you that one of the things that has been interesting during this COVID time is people who didn't think it was a part of their job because they were a doctor are now people who are saying, you know what, I knew so-and-so in medical school. They were a terrific person in research. I wonder what they're doing with the COVID vaccine. I wrote an article on a medium, why doctors should be networking. So I think all professionals should be networking. The problem is that people have a bad concept often that networking is not you know, a quality thing to do. So I'm gonna help you revisit what you think about networking if people have a bad concept and focus on networking is building relationships before you need them. Also networking is the transference of trust. And the reason why that part is very important is that as people are looking for an attorney or a recommendation, it could be for an attorney or it could be for someone who's going to, you know, install a, something in your home. You want to know it's somebody you trust. All right. So for those of you who remember driving a stick shift, it was usually not very pretty. So one of the things I encourage people to do is to find some events on LinkedIn or on um, you know, Eventbrite or one of those platforms, meet up and attend several events the way you would think about learning to drive a stick shift. You usually do not learn to drive a stick shift on a Porsche or a Maserati. You learn to do it on an old clunky car. And for people who don't drive stick shifts anymore, think about this as parallel parking. When you learn these things, you wanna learn it in a safe place where there's probably less chances of feeling awkward. And in some cases, curiously enough, that's gonna be in a room where you don't know people. For me, I find it much easier to learn to do something when there's total strangers in the room when, than when there's people who I know. I feel more nervous around them for some reason. So part of the advice I'm gonna to give to you today is for you to really think about where can you go to practice? What's the place for you? So go into an area where it has nothing to do with your profession or nothing to do with your area. In these days with Zoom, it's a very easy thing to do. When I work with some people on coaching and they're like, I really don't want to have to ask for help. I don't want to be a burden to somebody. I used to not so much right now, but hopefully you'll appreciate the concept. I would say find a grocery store, not in your neighborhood. Get two cans of soup and some crackers and go to people in line and say, would you please let me get in front of the line? I'm trying to get some soup and crackers to someone who's ill. And over and over again, they said, I don't know that I could ever do that. And again, they, I'm like, please just go try. And they're like, I did it. And they let me in the front of the line. And I said, of course, people want to be helpful. So part of it is finding a place to practice. So the whole idea was to do it in a grocery store, not in a neighborhood you live. You had two cans of soup and a crackers. And you went up and said, I'd like to help somebody. 
So part of that is learning. This is a tool I put together with my first book. I call it the event weather report, which is whether or not you go. You can use this for online or you can use this for in person. So today, some of you said, yep, it's worth it for me to go. You knew the host organization, the number of attendees. And what's interesting about Zoom is in some cases, small events are a little bit nicer. I was kind of happy when I found out it was small because people would get more attention today than when I'm speaking to hundreds of people. I've done both and I do it relatively well in person or online, but part of it is, and it depends on the experience. Will there be time for networking? I hope we have some time for networking. We've had a little bit already. The speaker, did you have a chance to take a look at my bio? I'm gonna hang around at the end for conversation and Q&A. Sometimes we wanna think about sponsors. I often tell people to go to a completely different industry event. Logistics, well, guess what? We don't have to be wearing high heels. We don't have to be parking right now. Some of that, it makes it so much easier for us to be attending events online. The organization attendee is something to think about too. In some cases, people are realizing they need to go up the food chain and or down the food chain, if you will. So I really enc encourage partners or people who are senior in um, you know, the bar association or something like that, invite somebody who's junior. When you're in um, you know, the state uh, organizations or the um, attorney general's office, you wanna have other people around. I had the pleasure of meeting the attorney general from Massachusetts a couple of years ago uh, at an event. And she brought two protégés with her and it was really wonderful for her to bring them along and have them see how she worked the room. She talked about running one of the largest law firms, if you will, um, at all. And so it was really interesting for them to observe her. She was doing some fundraising for a possible gubernatorial um, campaign at the time. Um, also have some networking buddies, have people who go with you to events and give you some feedback and help you think through you know, was that event something that was really a good event or is it one that I would probably skip in the future? Um, I would encourage you to get on boards. It's a really great thing to do. I, when I've been on um, volunteer boards, I can make phone calls and say, you know, I'm a volunteer board member with XYZ organization. I'd like to talk to you about X. I'll get a phone call back from them. than if I called them and said, you know, I'd like to talk to you about hiring me as a speaker. Um, weather doesn't matter right now. So right now, unfortunately, you know, we are in the situation. It's caused a lot of pain for people. Um, one of my good friends here in Boston had COVID, was on a ventilator for 11 days. Um, you know, so it, it's the weather has made it easier for us to go to events, but we have to remember that this has come at, you know, a significant um, problem and event. Here in Boston, probably the same for you all of you in New Jersey, you have to have snow dates. Um, in the winter time. So right now I would really encourage you to take advantage of the situation where we do have access online. Um, cameo, in some cases, you know, we are gonna be making cameo appearances at events. You're gonna drop in for a few minutes. Um, sometimes you'll do this in person. It's easier to do obviously virtually and pop in and out of events. You can also burn out. You can absolutely burn out. So you wanna be thinking about that. And who invited you? My suggestion is you be the person that does the inviting. Think about somebody who would find events interesting and say, I'll see you there. In the mornings, I try and do exercise. So I'm inviting people, join me to exercise because I'm more likely to show up if I know someone's going to be there. And speaking of a goal, I think in some cases, the goal at the end of the day is, can I follow up with people? When people say to me, when I coach them, oh, Diane, I got you know 20 business cards at that event. I'm like, great. Who's Nancy? Gee, I don't remember. And I rip up the car like, but that was a contact. I'm like, not if you don't remember what you're going to ask her and follow up with her. Did you have some information to share with her? Did you have a website? Did you have something along those lines? Otherwise, it's just data. It's just data. So we want to avoid that and have relationships. All right. This is how many of us feel right now. I know it's how I feel. And in some cases, I get it. But this, we can't make a living like this and we can't live like this. So yes, there'll be moments I'm in a ball. There'll be moments where I'm just thinking, I just want to, you know, I, and I felt this way before COVID. I absolutely felt this way at times before COVID. That's, you know, some of, the, some of my life has changed significantly and some of it hasn't. 
but there's many times when I wish I could just be in my little chair, sipping a drink and watching, you know, a good, funny show and get clients. It's just not going to happen. Or it was, how I was going to solve a crime. I'm crushed. I was a kid in Boulder. I'm just crushed about what's happening there. Um, and I think right now we want to do everything we can to support these agencies that are helping out. So part of it is thinking about how can you possibly be a resource for these people? And the reality is we have to kind of adult and say, you know what, I'm going to go face my fears or my you know, challenges and have some courage and think about how we can move forward. Um, this is an interesting chart and there's a wonderful attorney um, who's written a book called Quiet. Susan Cain is her name. It's a pretty dense book. She went to Harvard Law School, but she wrote a book about called Quiet. I've seen her speak and she talks about really the power of being an introvert. And a lot of people misunderstand introverts. So introverts start with a full tank of gas. They're full, they're happy, they're energized, and then they run into people and their tank goes down and they run into more people and their tank goes down and it goes down. The more people they interact with, the more tired they get. So what I find in some cases is that extroverts start with an empty tank, people, happy people, yes, more. And that, you know, the classic extrovert, if you will, is Bill Clinton. He could not be alone. And we know that got him into a little bit of trouble. Introverts, believe it or not, Oprah is an introvert. Um, Ellen DeGeneres is an introvert. And if you're a little bit older, you may remember Johnny Carson, definitely an introvert. So uh, David Letterman, big introvert as well. So there's pluses and minuses to both. There's a group in between ambivert and there are people who can function both ways. And I think really more and more, my hope is to have people be ambiverts. Um, I test on the introvert spectrum, but I am able to kind of become the extrovert when I need to do it. And um, earlier today, when we were having a little bit of quiet time, I was encouraging people to step up, you know, make some introductions and things along those lines. So part of what it is, is that I know how to kind of act with that extrovert outgoing style when I think it's helpful. I also do that when I think it's thoughtful. So I was in Europe. I spoke for the European Cardiology Society. And af after my uh, speech in the, the day, we went to a dinner. And at the cocktail party, I saw a man all by himself, you know, sipping a drink. And I said to the two gentlemen, you know, who were with me, I said, go invite them over to and join us, you know, for drinks. And they looked at me and they shake, shook their head a little bit scared. And I said, you know, well, why don't you go say hi? And they said, you show us how. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have totally failed. I just did a presentation on networking and they're not doing this. What was wrong? So they said, you show us. And I said, okay. So I walked over to this man. I was nervous. I'm not a cardiologist. I was full of imposter syndrome because here these people are literally opening up someone's heart. Think about that. They are literally opening up someone's heart. And so um, I went up to this gentleman and I said, um, excuse me, would you like to join our conversation? And I will always remember his response. He looked at me and said, that would be very kind. It gives me chills to this day. At the end of the dinner, and so then he ended up having dinner with the two guys he was with. One was from Iceland, one was from somewhere in Europe, and the gentleman I brought in was from Greece. At, and the gentleman from Greece was, you know, a little more on the more senior side of things um, as far as age. The two younger guys came up to me and said, you have no idea. He's, one, he's a rock star in the cardiology world. We would never have walked up to him. I hope you didn't think we were bad people. I said, of course not. That's absolutely fine but I hope you understand that I see you all as equals as human beings. And so sometimes a junior person can make a senior person quite, quite um, welcomed. The gentleman, the cardiologist from Greece came up to me at the end and he said, I wanna thank you for bringing me into the conversation. I had had a really tough day today in surgery. I can't imagine what a tough day is for a cardiologist in surgery. But I only, but what I do remember is that the three of them had a conversation over dinner and I thought, well, maybe they're going to invent a medical device. Maybe they will come up with a solution at some point to heart disease. You have no idea. But bringing people together has been kind of one of my missions throughout my time here. But also, you know, with that really up the ante, realizing this isn't about me and me feeling insecure or that I don't belong. It's me connecting other people. 
So I'm going to encourage you to do some personality assessments. You can do a Myers-Briggs, you can do a DIS, you can do Enneagram. If you want a free one, you can go on to match.com or one of the dating sites. Just tell your spouse why you are on a dating site, please. But I have turned out to be that my pers- my personality assessment is FFI. It stands for Friendly Functional Introvert. So I just showed, share, shared with you the story about being a functional introvert. I wanted this gentleman to feel included. I also felt a little awkward talking with these young guys who um, were surgeons and I was feeling very you know, insecure about all of what I was doing. So think about how you can help other people with that friendly, functional, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, either way. All right, a little bit about how to work rooms, both virtually and in person. We will be going back to this in person. And I'm happy to send you a copy of this um, diagram and what I'll send you a, a note in a minute and you can learn how to get this. But one of the things you wanna do when you attend virtual events is I do try and get on a little bit early. Have some water cooler time. Nancy and I had a little bit of water cooler time because of the, you know, confusion on the start time maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. Then you want to have kind of a start, you know, a starter conversation, have people do introductions along those lines. I always have a notebook and a pen with me ready to go because then I can write some notes right away because I see people's names. This is the virtual name name tag. We have our names now. And so I'll jot a few people's names down, somebody who speaks up, somebody who asks a question. I encourage you always to have a question. In person, it is that awkward moment when there's a round of applause and there's silence. And when someone says, are there any questions? And you're like, did I, was I boring? Is there something, do I, you know, spinach in my teeth? Is there something I've done wrong along those lines? So part of it is always have a question because the first question breaks the ice. The other thing I'm gonna encourage you to practice is your introduction. How do you introduce yourself? And for the, I don't have children. I always thought I would, but that's not how things worked out. But my mother had no name for 20 plus years. She was Diane's mom. She was not Ann Darling. She was Diane's mom. So think about how you can introduce yourself. And when I do this at the law schools, and I did it at a program not too long ago, and they'd introduce themselves as a 1L or a 2L and, and the law school that they were attending. And then they said their name. And I'm dyslexic, so I call this a dyslexic introduction. So I find this is helpful to the listener. If I start with my name and then I tell them something that, that, that is connects to them, they're gonna remember the connection, but they're gonna forget my name and then they're gonna feel awkward. So think about how you can do this. And I've learned, I have to say my name slowly because if I say, hi, I'm Diane Darling, I get Darlene, nice to meet you. If I slow down and say, I'm your speaker today, my name is Diane Darling. More people will remember my name and they'll know the connection of why I'm here. So think about writing that out a little bit, practicing it. And it's it feels awkward to do in the beginning. It feels really slow. When I started um, having myself videotaped, people had given me feedback that I was a fast speaker. And, but when I got myself videotaped, I'm like, oh my gosh, I am a way too fast speaker. I didn't want to not believe them, but it didn't quite make sense to me when they gave me that feedback after that, it really did. So now I slow down. I use these microphones and this headset a bit intentionally because it slows me down because I hear my voice in here instead of just ambient in that sort of a set situation. One thing I think about whenever I'm in a virtual event or in an in-person event is I wanna think about what can I do for that person? How can I help them? Is there an introduction? Is there an app? Is there a tool? Is there a website? Is there you know, um, someone who they should know? Is there something way I can be useful to them? Because then I can follow up and say, you know, I heard you mention X, Y, and Z. A lot of that in some cases is not necessarily work. I did this with a utility company in Ohio. And I said, we're gonna do an exercise here to see how we can help each other. And so what, what's something that someone's looking for? And someone, I said, it doesn't have to be work. And this woman says, I'm looking to learn Spanish. 
And so we found she was going to go to vacation in, I, I think it was Mexico. I'm not sure. And she goes, I just would like to learn a little bit of Spanish. And so we found that another person said her husband thought he could take down wallpaper and he wasn't doing such a good job. And she was looking for someone to help out with the repairs. We did that. I tried this another time at a pharmaceutical company when we were meeting um, for their offsite. And there were about 300 people in the room asking again, who needed help? It didn't have to be anything with business. And some of the questions are business, but not all. And this one woman very courageously said, I've got a 16 year old and he's hanging out with a bad crowd. Can anybody help me with my son? It was very courageous. And we created team Jason that afternoon. And different people helped her out. And one person um, had earlier had said they had a boxes, they had boxes of books after a move, and they were trying to figure out where to take the boxes and, you know, Goodwill, library. And one person suggested they take the boxes of books to the jail. So somebody else a few minutes later said, have the teenager take, get the boxes and then take the boxes to jail. And once he realizes what jail looks like, he won't be in trouble anymore. So we had lots of different ways to think about how we can help people. So part of it is being a little vulnerable, but part of it is also being useful, maybe in a way you really hadn't thought about. I'll, sh I'll share this with you again later on at the end of the presentation, but if you want that diagram, just open up your camera on your phone, hold it up and you can grab the QR code and just fill in that form. And hopefully the way I've set it up is the chart will come to you and I'll show this uh, uh, QR code at the end of my presentation as well. So one thing to think about is how we communicate. And certainly COVID has made a huge impact on this. And this is not a perfect study. This is also one I stopped showing at MIT because I got so challenged on the numbers, but it's an overview of a study that was done from UCLA. And basically if you cover up the red, you're missing some of my body language, not all of it because you're seeing it on camera right now. But if you covered up the red and the blue, every time you send an email or a text message, you forfeit 93% of your communication power. Think about that. 93% of your communication power is lost when you do email or text. I had a situation this last week with a young lady who's been doing some work for me. Um, and she was definitely having a stressful situation because her communication was getting pretty um, awkward um, on text messages and email. So I called her, she wouldn't pick up the phone. She says, oh, you know, let me know, I'll answer you on text. And we went back and forth at the end of the day, she said, you know what? I just don't wanna be on this project anymore. And I said, that's fine because I need people who can communicate in it is a whole person, not just part of you. So be careful on, I call this match.com for communications. If you're going to be sending um, a link for a Zoom, email or text is fine. If you're having a conversation about, you know, somebody who has done something that, you know, was a little awkward, maybe a phone call is easier than looking at the camera and talking to them and having that a little bit intensity now. Obviously, this is what's taken the toll with us being, um, you know, away from each other. I really am. I'm in the very beginning. I was frustrated that they called it social distancing. I wish they had called it physical distancing because we are still socially connected. And I, I really think that was a missed opportunity in many ways. But I wasn't at the White House, so I didn't have a power to say anything along those lines. Um, this is a little bit of humor. According to LinkedIn, you're a focused, disciplined achiever. According to Facebook, you love Jack Daniels and you are comfortable with your body. One thing I encourage people to do all the time, and forgive me, I live near Mass General Hospital and a fire station. So in a moment, you're going to hear the fire truck go by. I think it's a fire truck. But one thing I encourage people to do is to do an audit of your own social media. See how you come across. Get a Google alert with your name. Um, be sure that you're aware of any communications that are with your name or your brand or your company or anything along those lines. It's an important thing to do because you want to be sure you are in charge of the message, not somebody else. Um, LinkedIn for attorneys, you know, Google yourself and LinkedIn will typically come up. So you want to be on LinkedIn. These are the you know, fundamental elements of a good LinkedIn profile. You wanna have the about section. You wanna have a headshot. It should be a headshot that is professional. It should not be a headshot from a party or a wedding or something along those lines. 
You have your title, your location, and you can customize your LinkedIn URL. For example, mine is linkedin.com slash in slash Diane Darling. You can outsource this. I do it for people. Some other people do it, and but you want to be just really careful to be sure that you're doing it with somebody because you're giving them your password. Um, there's That's the only way to do it. And I encourage people to create a temporary password, let me in, I make the changes, do whatever writing they meet, need me to do. And then, um, and then you know, the, they can go back to their other password. But you want to have a, a, at minimal a basic a, a basic fundamental profile because people are going to find you there in the beginning of LinkedIn. People are a little bit more concerned about it, but now it's definitely a place you want to be. Um, I mentioned before about learning to ask for help. When I spoke for job hunters in Dallas, Texas years ago, a woman said she was looking for a job and they kind of didn't know what to do. Another woman said she was looking for a gold bag for a black tie on Saturday night and a whole bunch of people raised their hands. When you ask for help, make it clear, make it actionable, and make it so the other people person can actually achieve something by helping you. All right, winding down here with my part, and then we'll go to Q and A. Um, you never know where networking is going to go. And one of my silly examples is I was on a plane in um, from Boston down to Austin to teach at the University of Texas Law School. The gentleman sitting next to me um, was a very nervous flyer. And as we, the plane got more and more turbulent, he got more and more nervous. At one point we hit a bump really badly. Our arms went in the air. He grabs my hand from across the aisle and he starts holding my hand. And when I got on the plane, I thought I've seen this man summer before, have I seen him? So we started holding hands and I did whatever I could to distract him from the bumps. And I said, tell me what's taking you to Texas. And he says, I'm there for a football meeting. And I said, well, good grief. I teach people how to watch football. And he looked at me and he's like, you do what? And I said, well, if you can't speak sports, you can't network. That's really hard to do. We talk about sports around the water cooler. It's how you bond. So we are chatting about this. I'm doing whatever I can to make it as long and as involved as it is. We let go. And I said, well, sir, since we've held hands, should we introduce ourselves? He says, that's fair enough. My name's Gene DeFilippo. I said, why do I know your name? He says, I'm the athletic director for Boston College. Flash forward a year later, I see him at an event. I walk up to him and I do my dyslexic introduction. Sir, you may not remember me, but we held hands on a plane. He says, I remember you. And I said, I'd love to see if you'd ever want to teach football with me sometime. I'm too busy. I read in the Boston Globe that he had retired this several months later. And I sent him a postcard. I sent him a handwritten postcard. And I said, now that you're retired, do you want to do it? So we end up teaching football at the British consulate on a lark I called CBS News. They came and filmed it. That's the fun part. The bad news is they didn't show me at all, because a girl in football at the time didn't get much attention. Hopefully it's going to change. But at the moment it was, but it was a fun experience. And I encourage people to do what you never know. Um, one of the things I'm doing during COVID is I have a lot of business cards. So I'm taking this time to figure out, to connect with these people. So my system is, is that ideally I've written something on the back of the card that reminds me of the situation. I put them into my CRM. There's a card scan app. There's a lot of apps. And then I invite them on LinkedIn. And I'm simply owning the fact that, you know what, it's been a while. I have your card. I'm doing this as a COVID project. I'd love to hear what's new with you and say hello. And then I'm doing a calendar invitation. So you may want to do something with this kind of quiet time, if you will. Um, which leads me to another kind of just fun story where I was at an event and I put my um, bag over my shoulder and I hit somebody and the person I hit was Dr. Ruth. And some of you may or may not know who she is. I will tell you, I am five, three and a half. This young lady is small. Um, and so I said, I'd love to interview you about your career path. And she said, that would be great. And she rattled off her phone number so fast. And I learned always to have a notebook and a pen in my pocket. And so I just said, I'd love to talk to you. And so the next thing I knew I was having um, coffee with Dr. Ruth in New York. And at the end of the coffee, I said to her, you know, where are you headed to your next meeting? And she told me where it was. And I said, I'll walk you there. And she said, you don't have to. And I says, 
no, I don't, but I would like to. And it was so much fun to be walking down the street in New York with Dr. Ruth. The, the taxis were blowing their horn, Dr. Ruth, Dr. Ruth. She has quite a fan club. But you, when things go wrong, find something good. I had no intentions of hitting anybody, but when I bumped her with my bag and it wasn't, you know, a hit, but it was definitely, you know, you, you, know, you put your bag over your shoulder, you got a laptop in there. I mean, it's not exactly a bump. And, you know, so sometimes we're going to make mistakes, pick up the pieces. What's next after a mistake? So if you feel like you've made a mistake with somebody, what's next? You know, go ahead and say, hi, this was one of the most memorable experiences of my life. And her mission is to bring joy in the world because she lived. She says this over and over again. I lived. I have to do the most with my life. I lived. Not everybody else in my family did. And there's a great documentary about her on Hulu. I encourage you all to watch that. So here's some action steps for you. All right. One of the things you want to do is do, think about loneliness. We are in a lonely, lonely situation. And so connecting matters, no matter what your age is or what your um, you know, gender, where you are professionally or whatever else it is, making a call to somebody makes it, it makes it makes it a really kind thing for them to do. Earlier this week, I opened up my mail and somebody was beyond generous um, in giving me a check for something. And I had no expectations for this at all. Um, and um, they just said, I was thinking about, you know, what to do with this. And I, I realized I wanted to give you, give you something. So I was just beyond amazed with that. So thinking about how you can make somebody else's day and get this kind of um, karma going, if you will. So I'm going to suggest you practice your introduction, um, practice some events virtually or in person when we get there, you know, be careful, obviously, um, you know, update your LinkedIn profile, um, call two to three past connections and, you know, practice your conversation starters in addition to your introduction. Um, this is a vanity slide. I will just own that. These are my books in nine languages. So it's fun because I can't read those languages, but my books are in them. And you are all more than welcome to invite me on LinkedIn, um, or if you can send me an email, if you do send me a note on LinkedIn, it would be great if you just mentioned this program, because I get some invitations from some weird people. So just mention this program, and here's that diagram, um, that QR code. So if you want to just take that for a minute, and uh, we can go ahead and um, get into some Q&A, and you can turn your cameras on, hopefully, and feel courageous ask some questions and please know I'm here to help you out. However, that could be useful to you. And um, so I'll give you another moment to um, grab that QR code. And, uh, and I'll also put in the chat in a moment, a, a link that might be helpful. So I will stop the share and Nancy, you can come back and we can um, take it from there. Maybe stop the share. Oops, I gotta go over here with this. Okay, if um, folks, if you're watching this on YouTube and you need any further information about our speaker, Diane Darling, or this program, please call Lawyers Assistance at 800-246-5527. And I'm going to stop the recording so that we can move on to uh, Q&A part of this program. <laughs>